before we begin, I have a slight demonstration I would like to show you. Play that video one more time for me. I like to watch it happen slowly. I think it's quite interesting when you see that all he touched was one thing. And that one thing had the capacity to impact many other things, bigger than it, stronger than it, more powerful, more mass, yet it started with one thing. Look at your neighbor and say, one thing. Look at the other neighbor and say, one thing. And I look behind you, and in an awkward moment, yell at the person behind you and shout, one thing. <laughs> if you got yelled at, now yell at the person in front of you and say, one thing. <laughs> the book of Matthew, chapter 6, and verse 33. I was like, <laughs> Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. In our church, we have our leadership team, including myself. We have been reading a book a week. And so far, the latest book that we are currently reading is what? Oh, come on, there's about 13 of y'all. The latest book we'll be reading is what? One thing. The one thing. And in his book, Gary Keller on the one thing overemphasizes on the power and the ability of one. He overemphasizes on the reality that to be a multitasker is to be multi failure. In other words, people who claim to be great at multitasking are people who are great at doing little of everything. And so he begins to talk about this one thing phenomenon that if you are looking to ever be great in life, you need to find one thing. When I say Nike, what comes to your mind? Just do it. You don't hear pizza. You don't hear, you never go into a Nike store looking to eat a meal. Nobody goes to a Nike store looking for anything other than a Nike product. One thing. Somebody say one thing. one thing. And so he talked about how many times the people who are, 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 are doing not so well in life have substituted greatness for busyness. That it is possible to be very busy and not effective. Uh, because busyness has an ability to trigger your brain to believe you are where you should be. And so you end up working 60 hours a week, but there's no return on your investment because you're doing 75 other things. 
but the effectiveness to you is your ability to handle so many things at once while the people you are trying to be like are only carrying one thing. God created the heaven and the earth. And throughout the Bible, we see this overemphasis of one. Started with one man. And out of the man, he pulled a woman. One thing that has the ability to be replicated, but with compound interest. In other words, interest that is not added, but it's multiplied. It grows, just like the video that we watched with the domino. The man touched one little small thing, yet that same momentum with touching one thing had the ability to grow, to touch bigger things. And so I, 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 I always say that whenever we read a book in a business term, we have to realize that these people are simply plagiarizers. They copy from the Bible, and then they try to make it into their own uh, philosophy, and they try to make it into their own term, and they try to tell you and sell you on the 10 steps of success, but they steal from Jesus. Because, see, Jesus taught about one thing. He, he said... Seek ye first. Seek for one thing that has the ability to add every other thing to it. And so as I begin to look at the text, I wanted us to expand on this text a little bit. Uh, but first, whenever we are studying the Bible, we must understand the Bible was not written in verses and chapters. Uh, there was nobody when writing the Bible that goes, hey, let's write John chapter 1. These were scrolls, and it was over time as we developed, now we saw the Bible now divided. The reason why that's important is if you know that it's not written in chapters and verses, and it's really written as a complete and whole book, books and scrolls of books, when you see the word but, and you start there, you miss out on the whole context because if you just say Matthew 6 and 33, and you just read Matthew 6 and 33, then you missed out on the whole text. And so we must see the whole of Matthew 6. What is going on in this Bible verse? What is happening before the word but? But first, let's understand what the word but means. Because the, the verse starts with but seek first the kingdom of God. And so I begin to look up the word but. And it says... It's used to introduce a phrase or clause contrasting with what has already been mentioned. That's just the English word, but. Another definition says coordinated conjunction used to connect ideas that contrast. What is the contrasting idea to the phrase after but? Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. See, to properly understand this, we must understand this context. Matthew 6, 33 actually begins at Matthew 4 and 17. It actually begins there. Now, the reason why is because after Jesus' ministry, he begins his ministry and he had been baptized and uh, tempted and tested. And that verse says, from that time, Jesus began to preach. You say, why am I talking about that? Because Matthew 4 introduces this idea of the very thing that Jesus told us to seek after. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And so we must go all the way down to when he first mentioned kingdom. To properly understand what's going on in the text. And he says, from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Another version says, the kingdom has come. It's near it's here. Now, if Jesus in the start of his ministry begins to use the word kingdom, kingdom, we must then break down the word kingdom to understand its very meaning. You see, kingdom is a combination of two words, king and domain. King and domain. And the domain is an area or territory that is ruled by a king. Kingdom is a combination of two words, king 
and domain. And a domain is an area or territory that is ruled by a king. That's a natural way of understanding it, but the spiritual way is this concept of kingdom in spiritual terms. It's God's agenda for the advancement of his will on earth. In other words, it's God's intentional desire to expand the kingdom of heaven on earth. This is where it gets complicated. Because this ideology did not start in Matthew. As a matter of fact, it didn't start in Malachi. Neither did it start in Psalms, Proverbs, or Exodus. To properly understand this idea of God expanding the kingdom of heaven to earth, we must go all the way to Genesis. Uh, because uh, Jesus was not the one who introduced the kingdom. As a matter of fact, he came to reintroduce what we forgot. You see, the kingdom was not a new phenomenon. He came to bring about a reminder of what was already there. That's why we see words like repent. We see that word we is another method of doing again. And so if Jesus came to tell us to do something again, what should we have done the first time? Genesis chapter 1 from verse 1 to 5 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. This is the, the beginning of creation. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Now, if you study the book of Genesis chapter 1, then you will see uh, where the, it goes through this, uh, this, this, this concept of God going around and he's creating the earth from scratch. He's creating animals here. He's creating the seas and, and nature and the stars. And, and he would speak to this and speak to that. And it became, it, it was just beautiful. Like when I see it as a movie, I'm like, man, I just imagine God walking and saying, and let there be waters and there were waters, and let there be land, and there was land, and he's creating all of these things, and he creates the sea creatures and the land creatures, the birds of the sky, and I begin to ask myself the question that all of us ask, was God bored? Because typically when I create things, I do it out of boredom. When I want to watch animals and shows, I do it sometimes when I get bored. And so I began to ask myself questions like, was God bored? Was, did, did he run out of animals in heaven? Did, did heaven have a shortage of, of, of real estate? Was there a shortage of real estate in heaven? Was something missing in heaven that God would say, I want to come down and, and, I, and I, I, I just want to watch the animals? If that is not the reality, then why was earth created? Somebody say why. Was earth, was earth created? created. Uh, the reason why this is important is because when you see the Bible that says in Genesis chapter 1, from verse 1, in the beginning, God. That means that that beginning is not defining God's beginning because in the beginning that we see within our context, we find God doing something. We don't find something being done to God. If it says in the beginning, Something created God, then it's different. But when it starts with in the beginning, God, that means in the beginning, within our context of beginning, in the beginning of our time, and within our context of time, God was already in existence. Why is that important? Because in that very beginning that we see, when you look at science and nature, is where we begin to talk about the introduction of the universe. And so if in the beginning of our time, God was found doing, then that means the universe cannot be God because God created it. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
uh, you cannot be when you did not create yourself. Somebody get me another mic, please. You cannot be when you did not create yourself. Somebody say in the beginning. God. In the beginning. God. And so whenever you're looking at this text, it's very, very important. Because sometimes we can, we, we, we can, we can kind of intertwine things. Well, it, it, it's, it's God created it, so it's technically God. And, and I understand that's, that's dope, that's cool. But I'm going to tell you right now, I would be very insulted if you called me an iPhone. I'd be very mad if you called me a bucket of water. Why do we call what God created God? You see, it's so interesting because when you study that text, there was only one thing that God in creation said, I want to make this to be like me. I want this to have my resemblance. I want this to have my likeness. I want this to be just like God. And so Genesis chapter 1 from verse 26 to 28, it answers this question. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. What are all these things that God is mentioning? The things he already created. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the things God created. Over the birds of the heavens, the things God created. And over every living thing that moves on the earth, the very things God created. You see, God had created everything. Everything on the outside and everything on the inside. And then he created something beautiful, someone beautiful. You and I, Adam, the first human. I don't have time to get into a theological debate. Not because I don't want to. Because I just only have 30 minutes. But you see, when it says God created Adam and it says male and female created he them. Then it's important to study Adam and what that word actually means. Because in the very creation of humanity, God created male, female to be equal of one in his spirit. That means he gave the male and the female the very same ability to have his spirit. I'm going to stop there so I don't ruffle some feathers. I still want to get to my text. And in his mandate to man, like a real toy that goes around showing you houses, God begins to do something that was so interesting. He said in verse 29, and God said, behold, I have given you. Imagine God and Adam just walking around. Behold, I've given you every plant you'd in seed that is on the face of all the earth. And every tree with seed and its fruit, you should have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And as if that's not enough proof to see what Genesis was trying to tell us, Psalms 115 from verse 16 puts it in plain sight. It says, the heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. He created earth for me. Oh, that sounds tough. It was hard for y'all to say that. You see, if you start teaching stuff like this, they call you a prosperity preacher. 
because we cannot grasp our mind behind the thought that God would do something for you. We can't wrap our mind around the fact that God would take out time for you. That he did not create earth because he was bored or he ran out of animals in heaven. That he created it for you. We can't wrap our mind around that. We can't wrap our mind that God positioned you in a place where he wanted to see you thrive. Not see you down. Not see you beg. But he positioned you in a place, and this is in the beginning. At this point, there was no church. There was a relationship between God and man. They didn't have a a, a, a complication. They didn't have uh, anybody in between the offerings that man would give to God. This was a pure relationship where God says, I'm not just going to meet everything you need. I'm going to give you everything you want. Just one condition. Don't eat that tree over there. We can't wrap our minds around this concept that God gave man a mandate to function like him on the earth. Somebody say God created earth for me. And you see, and this was working perfectly fine. It was, everything was going perfectly good. I mean, Adam and Eve were going around and, and it was so beautiful to the point that even in Genesis 2 and 19, look at this, look at this. It says, now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens. And he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Is it because God ran out of names? Is it because the king of kings and the Lord of lords was not intelligent? God was trying to tell Adam, saying, fam, I want you to manage this. I want you to handle this so much so that I'm not even going to name the animals. I'm going to bring them to you. And whatever name you call that animals, that will be their name. I want you to get it into your mind that I created this for you. Somebody say, God. Created earth for me. Uh, God gave man one thing. The book of Genesis chapter 2 from verse 7. It says, and God formed man from the dust of the ground. And God breathed into his spirit the breath of life. And man became a living soul. One thing. That had the capacity and the ability to cause man to do everything. One thing. One thing. I'm going to create man in my image and likeness so that man can dominate. One thing. It wasn't about the height or the brain capacity. God said, I'm just going to put my spirit in you. And my spirit on the inside of you is literally enough. Through my spirit, you find provision, protection. Through my spirit, you find peace. And all of this stuff was working until Genesis chapter 3. In the book of Genesis chapter 3, man sinned and rebelled against God by disobeying the very command that God gave man in Genesis 2 and 16. And 17. It says, and the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. God have mercy. And what happened in Genesis chapter 3 from verse 6 to 7? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, And that it was a delight to the eyes. And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. The man and the woman 
They sinned against God by disobeying the very command God gave them. And in Genesis chapter 3 from verse 23, it says, Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of east of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east of the garden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Adam and Eve were kicked out of a place of rest because they disobeyed God's will. They had one thing going for them. They were given one tree not to touch. And yet it was that one tree that they ate from. The power of one. One small decision. Hmm. One small decision cost them everything God already positioned for them. One small decision caused them to be kicked out of the garden, out of the desired environment that God had for them. And the results of being kicked out of God's environment is what we see today. You see, sin takes you away from your purpose and from your God-ordained environment. Sin takes you away from your purpose and from your God-ordained environment. Somebody read that out loud with me. Say sin. Keep going. Now I want you to say it, but rather than say you, say me. You see, whether this be physical or mental, man had that one thing that was going for him, and he ruined it and lost it, and it caused a cataclysmic effect on this world. We are still bearing the sufferings of that one decision. You see, the introduction of sin, which is rebellion against God, introduced earth's rebellion towards man. When man rebelled against God, everything else rebelled against man. The ground now can only yield fruit from the pains of the man. The animals that were supposed to rule are now attacking humans. And the very earth we were meant to care for and cater to now responds to our lack of management. Earthquakes. Crazy weather. The earth is now responding to us not managing it. And then the very same earth that we're meant to dominate now dominate us. The plants God's told us to dominate. Plants like grape. Now we are being dominated by fermented grapes. Can't do without your fermented grape when you're so depressed. I need to have my fermented grape because I'm going through a lot. The very thing that God said you ought to dominate now dominates you. I can't get rid of this great. I need this plant because I'm dealing with anxiety. I need a plant for my anxiety. The plant that God said you ought to dominate. Without this plant, I can't get rid of my anxiety. Without this plant, I overthink. Without this fermented grape, I can't have peace of mind. When man rebelled against God, man fell from his dominion authority. And the very thing he was meant to be in control over, he allowed to now control him. Families became dysfunctional. No more love in the homes. The next chapter we see in Genesis chapter 4, the introduction of murder within the families. Before we get to the murder within the families, it is easy to understand, help me Holy Ghost, why murder would happen in the family. Because Genesis chapter 3 from verse 12 lets us know why Genesis chapter 4 happened. Genesis 3 and 12, the very man uh, that, that, that looked at Eve and said, this is the bone of my bone, the flesh of my flesh. He said to her, he said to God, the woman whom you gave to be with me. The woman you gave. The woman. 
God have mercy. If I ever call my wife a woman, I'll get slapped. There are syllables that I can use only. Baby, sweetheart, chicken pot pie. All the foods I like to eat. If I call a woman, uh, I might come in here, you might see me doing this, and you think I'm preaching good, but my face hurting. He said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit and I ate. God have mercy. It ain't me, God, it's her. It's the woman you gave me, it had nothing to do with me. And there we see the introduction of fathers leaving their post. There we see the introduction of a man committing an act with a woman. And when the dust settles, he don't want to be in the scene. We did it together, but now that the dust has settled, and I understand because if that was the introduction of Adam, it would only make sense that he would do that with his children. The woman that you gave me, we saw the very beginning of introduction of a dysfunctional home where a man would say, mm, mm -mm. yeah, I know we did it together, but no, nah, it was you, you wanted it. You know I didn't want that. You already knew I wasn't trying to eat that. You know? I didn't want that tree. God is the woman you gave me. Adam left his post. And then from that dysfunctional family of a man not taking responsibility, we saw two boys. I wonder, God, I don't have time. I wish I, wish I was in my Bible class so I could talk to my Bible students because I don't want to get into a theological debate in the pulpit because I still got an assignment. I just wonder why Adam was nowhere to be seen. After that, study the text. You see, sin calls for greed to be multiplied, anger to be multiplied, and death to be multiplied. And how can we all come from Adam and yet one group now wants to enslave the other? One group now says I'm better than you because my skin is lighter than yours. I'm better than you because I have a different pigmentation on my body. I'm better than you. You are supposed to be lower than me. And all of us came from Adam. Same seed. And now you want me to be your slave. You see, sin has the same compound effect as righteousness. Just like the video that I showed you in the beginning, the same one decision to serve God has the same capacity as the same one decision to serve the devil. Everything in the spiritual realm has a compound effect. You see, sin created this environment, uh, and, and man knew that this environment was not what they wanted to live in. They knew it, and they hated it, but they had one hope. They had one hope. They were holding on to the promise that God gave to Adam and Eve in God's rebuke of the serpent. You see, God told and spoke to the serpent, Adam and Eve. But Adam and Eve was paying closer attention to what God said to the serpent. And they hold on to the words. Because think of what God said to the serpent in Genesis 3 and 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and he shall bruise his heel. The easy version puts it this way. I will cause you and the woman to become enemies. Your descendants and her descendants will always be enemies. Now here is the key. One of her descendants will attack your head, and you will attack his ear. Another version traded the word descendant for the word seed. In other words, God says, I know y'all messed up, but hey, listen to me, serpent. She going to get hers one day. A descendant from this woman, a child that she was born. 
will come and will end this mess that you started. And they held on to the promise. But now everybody looking for the seed. Is it going to be Cain? Is it going to be Abel? Who is this seed? You got to imagine the worriness that's going on in the text because Adam like, man, I need this seed to come on because, see, I don't want to keep digging with the pains for this plant to bear me some fruit. Eve is like, man, I don't want to keep having birth pains too much. When is this seed going to come? When is this seed? Where's the seed? Where's the seed? We need this person that will be born, that will pay the price for the sin, and we start us back into a relationship with God. We need this one thing. And so humanity began to search for the next descendants. They thought it would be Abel, but Abel died. They thought it would be Noah, but Noah got drunk and rebelled against God. And they were waiting and waiting. Where would this seed come from? Who is this person? And God then gave Abraham another clue. Generations after God gave Abraham a clue in Genesis 22 verse 18, he said, And in your seed, in your offerings, in your offspring, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And so now we held on to another word. Now we get another clue on who this seed and where this seed will come from. Now we know it has to be a seed, not just a seed from Eve, but now it's also a seed of Abraham. The prophets began to prophesy it. They began to drop clues, but no one knew exactly who this person would be. Who is this person that will come to restore the one thing that we need? You say, why was this important? This is important because in the book of Romans, chapter 6 from verse 23, whoever this person is, they will have to pay the price for the sins of man. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin, for the price, for the cost, for the consequence of sin is death. Something had to die. Something had to die. Good God, have mercy. But, but look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. Not just something, but someone. Now look at your neighbor, ask, why wasn't Abel's death enough to pay the price? Ask your neighbor, ask him, ask him, ask him. I don't know if y'all ask the same question. <laughs> Look at this. We've read this and we've missed this in the text. It said the wages of sin is death. The price of sin is death. The price, the consequence of sin is death. The consequence of sin. You have to be willing to pay for something. Uh, you see, when we talk about consequence and we talk about price, there has to be a willingness to pay if I go to the store. You know, I'm from Nigeria, and I'm not used to being in an American system where, you know, we, 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 we eat and then we pay after. That wouldn't work so much well when I was growing up. If we eat and you talking about pay after, what am I paying for? A meal go? <laughs> but I remember the first time I came to the United States and I sat in the restaurant and I was getting ready to pay, and the man was like, no, don't worry about it. I'm like, really? Thanks. And then they brought the check. I'm like, that's deceit. That's deceitful. That's not of God. But you see, if I'm going to eat the food, then I must be willing to pay the price. The restaurant cannot come and put a gun to my head. The restaurant cannot legally come in and steal your card. You have to be willing to pay before you get the item. Why is that important? If we as humans were willing to sin, nobody forced man to eat of that tree. Nobody put a gun to Adam's head or a sword to Adam's head to say, hey, Adam, you have to eat this. Nobody did that. And so if man was willing to sin, that means the price must be paid by someone who was willing to die. It cannot be someone who was murdered. That's why Abel was not it. It can't be somebody who was killed because they were not willing, they were not expecting to die. It has to be somebody who willingly lay down. Because if you willingly sin, then to pay the price you must willingly die. Who is this person? 
this person could not be killed against their own will. They must of their own decide to pay the price for sin. And, and also they have to be sinless, you see. They have to be sinless. Because dirt don't pay for dirt. They got to be sinless. How can you be sinless yet willing to die? You see why it was hard for any man to decide to be. That's why it took generations. Everybody else was either not sinless or they were killed. And so who is going to come that will be sinless and yet willing to die? Revelation tells us what's going on. It says, who shall I send and who will go for us? We've been searching and searching. Who going to die? You know, I love couples when they be like, you might ride or die. You can't say that to somebody put a gun in front of your wife. To my ride or die. You know you're going to run. <laughs> or die. <laughs> I work in high school and all the kids be so in love. Man, baby, I'll do anything for you. You can't even stop cheating. You can't, even, you can't even treat her with respect. Are you going to do everything? I'll give the world to you. You don't even own your home. You see, no man was able to die. Nobody was willing to say, I will be the sacrifice. I will be the one that will lay my life down. So we keep searching. Who is this seed? Who is this seed? And see, in an effort to bring us into his rest, I believe that God got tired of waiting. Then in the book of John, chapter 3 from verse 16, God did something that was so miraculous, supernatural, but something that was so graceful. He interrupted the very order of earth. He created earth in such a way that seed has to come from the man to partner with the egg of the woman, and she births the child. But God, in his rich grace and mercy, said, I can't keep seeing my people living like this. I'm going to pull the curtains of heaven, and I will send down an extension of myself to come and be born of a woman. You see, Jesus could not come like an angel have come in the past. If you read the Old Testament throughout the text, we have seen angels come and be shown. So we're not talking about, oh, there was no other way. We've seen angels be present in the, on the Old Testament. We've seen an angel talk to Zechariah in the New Testament. But whoever this person may be, an angel could not die because whoever must die must be man. In other words, it must be a human being because it was a human being that sinned against God. And so a human being had to pay the price for the sin of a human being. And so, God in his wisdom put the seed into this virgin woman. She had to be a virgin. So, no man can ever take credit. But not only did she have to be a virgin, when you look at blood and DNA, sin, the Bible says we are born into sin. Sin, that rebellious nature that's inside man, it kept on duplicating itself. So that seed, that blood that's in the man, it now become the blood in, a, in, 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 in his child and his children. And we kept on seeing this blood that was already tainted with rebellion. That's why nowadays I was so shocked. I saw my son. I don't even know who, who, who told him or taught him to run and not listen. And I'm, I'm like, son, I never told you that. But you know how you have kids. And anybody who's parents in here, you know how your son or your daughter, you don't got to do nothing to them. They just get up lying. <laughs> Born lying. I didn't do it. <laughs> who taught you to lie? Did somebody visit you? There's that sinful nature that's natural. 
It's a natural rebellious nature. And so this woman had to be a virgin. She had to be one who has not been tainted with the seed of man. In other words, Jesus cannot come from the seed of a man physically because that nature was rebellious. That nature could not pay the price. That's why we sing songs like, have you been washed with the blood? Have you been born again? That's where that concept of being born again comes from. Because naturally we are born into sin because the rebellious nature that's tainted in our very blood replicates and duplicates. And so whoever this person has to be, for this person to be sinless, they could not come from a man's seed. But yet they have to be born on earth. And so the Holy Spirit placed a seed on the inside of a virgin woman named Mary. Before she ever did anything with Joseph. So nobody gets confused to say, is it Joseph's child or not? Joseph knew it wasn't his and he was trying to divorce her quietly. So that let us know that indeed she was a virgin. And so we see something interesting. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son one. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But in order that the world might be saved through him. You see this son, this Jesus Christ was perfect for the job because of two major things. Number one, he was without sin. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 from verse 21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him to be the price for your redemption. Hebrews 4 verse 14 to 15. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus the son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. Yet what? Without sin. First Peter chapter 2 from verse 21 to 22. For to you... For to, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He what? Committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Number one, Jesus was perfect for the job because he was without sin. Number two, it was his choice to the book of John chapter 15 from verse 13. Greater love has no one than this. That someone lay down. Not that someone gets murdered. Not that someone gets killed. But that someone lay down his life for his friends. The book of Titus chapter 2 from verse 13 to 14. Waiting for our blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people, for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. The book of John, chapter 10, from verse 17 to 18. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life. That I might take it up again. No one takes it from me. That means nobody killed. He made a decision to be killed. He made a decision to die. No one takes it from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. And I have authority to take it back up again. This charge I have received of my father. And so what we find in the book of Matthew chapter 6 from verse 33 was simply this Jesus in his introduction of explaining why he came, explaining what is missing and why the kingdom of heaven is important. He introduces this point in Matthew 6 and 19 by telling the crowds that were gathered to hear him preach, saying to them, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth 
where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And in verse 24, he says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's speaking to a people who have forgotten who they were. He says, don't y'all understand? I'm talking to you about a kingdom. You worrying about the things that you need. You've been so caught up with this life, with this dysfunction, that I'm telling you that there is one thing that God can give you that can supplement and supply everything you think you need. I'm telling you that this is not the way God created you to live. I'm telling you that God has created you in such a way that he wants to be the one in control over your life. Don't lay up treasures in temporary things. Somebody says temporary. temporary. Now, this is where it gets interesting, brothers and sisters. Because why would Jesus talk about laying up treasure not on earth? Yes, earth was made for us. But why would he say, don't lay up treasure on earth? but lay it up in heaven. It seems interesting, but then I began to study the Bible, and I saw that Hebrews 9 verse 27 gives a clue to that. It says, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 from verse 13 to 14 says, the end of the matter is this. All that's been heard, fear God and keep his commandment. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. You see, our life on this earth is very temporary. Jesus had to come to remind us that don't be so caught up here. There is a time that is coming where judgment will be served. And this is the reason why you must seek first the kingdom of God. There was a judgment coming where every deed that you have made, whether good or evil, will be brought before God. I put it this way. I preached this a few years back. And I told him, I said, everything that's in your house will speak. I use that analogy to explain that nothing is hidden before God. Your bed will talk. Your bed will tell what's been in it. Your computer will tell what's been in it. Your phone will tell what's been in it. On that day, nobody will be shocked. There will not be anybody that will say, oh my, I did not know. There was a day coming, and it's so much so close than it's ever been, where God will bring every work and every deed to judgment. Now, look at this. Look at this. Hell is a real place, and not only is it real, it is a place that is reserved for people who willingly choose to go there. Now, let me say this real quick because this can be triggering for some. How do you willingly choose to go to hell by making a decision that goes against the will of God. Look at what 2 Peter chapter 3 from verse 9 says. It says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He said, this is the will of God. If you're ever confused about the will of God, it's so you don't go to hell. If you're ever confused about God's will, it is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish. 
there is nobody in hell that God does not love. But there is everybody in hell who don't love God. You see, to love God is to do his will. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love God, you would do what his word said. Jesus says, seek first. Seek first. Seek first. There was one thing that should be number one in your life. There was one thing that should be of the most importance in your life. And Jesus was so serious about this message that in the book of Matthew chapter 5, the chapter before this chapter, in verse 29, it says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, this is the chapter before it, cut it off. And throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body. God was not saying literally take a knife and cut yourself. He's saying this stuff is so important. It's so deep that you got to do something radical about it. You got to be willing to sacrifice whatever it takes. Because this kingdom, this walk is so important. You got to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is not a show. It's not to act. It's not to look like a Christian. There was a time coming and it's not going to be 70 years or 20 years or 30 years. There was a time coming where for all eternity you will have to pay the price for your life. For the things that you did. Jesus addressed this. He says, hey, if it's not God's will that anyone should perish, but that all should come into eternal life, that means everyone who goes to hell made a clear choice to go there. They chose to go against God's will. Whether through their actions, their life, their unrepentant sins, or the things that they treasure. Jesus addressed this in simplistic form in the book of Matthew 6 and 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Now look at verse 33, but seek ye first. Somebody said the one thing. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things seek first to be in right standing with God. That's what righteousness is. To be in God's right standing. To be right with God. Jesus said this is both a temporary and an eternal benefit. God will meet all your needs. All these things will be added unto you. But eternally, if you're in right standing with God, your soul is going to be saved on the day that Jesus comes again. I'll close with this. The book of Matthew 24 from verse 36 to 42. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven or the Son, but the Father only. For at his where the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of God. Son of man, then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the meal. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Today is a day where you get an option to choose the one thing. This Christian walk is not for looks or for accolades. It's not to be church famous or to be known in any capacity. God sent his son to die for you. And if he was willing to pay that their price... It is the more evidence that there is indeed a hell. 
he doesn't want you to go to hell. It says in hell there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Where the worms die not. And it's not for a day. It's not for an hour. It's not for a year. It's for ever. Eternity. Away from God. There is nothing on this life that is worth more. This is the reason why Jesus was so critical. He says, fam, hear me out. He says, this is, should be more important than what you eat and what you drink. He says, this should be so much more important than the clothes that you put on. He said, this thing is more important than the very thing you consider your, your, your necessities because normally as humans we need something to drink to live. He said this kingdom is more important because in hell there is no water, there's no food, and there is no God. And it's eternity. Forever. And it will be so much nicer if you can just die. But you can't. You live forever away from God in pain that cannot be described. You can fake this thing. You can fake church. Oh yes, church can be faked. It takes folks to have discernment to understand the difference between emotionalism and the spirit of God. You can fake it. Play the right chords. Get the right beats and you can get emotion and we can shout and we can dance and we can lift our hands. You say, Pastor, what do you mean you can fake it? It's the same reaction you get if you go to a Super Bowl or you go to a concert where the name of the Lord has not been mentioned. But we lift our hands and we turn up. All of these things could be faked. All of these things could be all emotionalism. And we go to church and we feel good. We feel great. And because I, I feel good, that means I felt the spirit. But you feel good when you watch a show. You feel good when you eat food. You feel good when your favorite team wins. You're going to feel good a hundred years later when the Cowboys finally win. You will feel good. I'm sorry. Just want the light in the mood. But what's not going to feel good is to hear the words depart from me. I never knew you. I'm telling you right now is a time that you surrender everything that you are to God. We're not here to play church. We're not here to play community. There's going to be a community in hell. We're not here to play things that we consider to be necessities that are not. Jesus Christ was bruised, spat on, thorns on his head, nails on his hand, and he became sin who knew no sin. So don't expect God to look at you on the day of judgment and say, oh, I feel bad for you because he ignored his own son at the cross. He said, Father, Father, why art thou forsaken me? Now that you have breath in your lungs, is the time that you have to say, I give myself away. You don't know the time or the hour when Jesus will come again. You don't know the time or the hour when God will ask for his breath back from you. There's been many stories of saints who have died and you ought to see them when they die. They smiling and they're so happy. Because God is coming to pick them up and carry them. And you also have to watch videos of people who died who were not in God. The horror in their eyes. 
they're screaming while they're in the bed. Go watch these things. It's available. My mother died two weeks before I turned eight. And she was smiling. She was so happy. Because she had walked this walk. And she had talked this talk. And in her last breath, she was happy because Abba came to get her. And so this life is not something that we're living to play games. I want to see mommy again. I want to see Abraham. I want to see David. I want to see Jesus. I don't want to spend eternity in hellfire. Forever and ever. Weeping. How are you crying and crying and no water and you don't run out of tears? That's painful. Weeping forever. But this morning, I'm here to offer you one thing. I wrestled with this text so much that this was not my plan at all to preach from this text in this way. The Lord would not let me sleep. He said there's some people in that room that needs to hear this because they don't know the time or the hour and it's time to stop playing church it's time to stop playing I believe, it's time to stop playing I love God on social media and it's time to say God you can have my heart for real you can have my heart for real I'm going to make the one decision that has the ability to catapult me to my next level, to my next season, that would change my life forever. How do you make that decision? The book of Romans, chapter 10, from verse 9, says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised them from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him would not be put to shame. For there was no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved if you know that you don't know this Jesus you know you don't know this Jesus as your Lord and Savior I want to give you an opportunity that's the biggest thing that's happening today yes we are having a graduation and that's amazing but heaven does not rejoice when you become a member of a church. There are people who join churches every day. And all it takes is one message for them to be offended. I just ain't made you mad yet. <laughs> but the truth hurts. People join churches. We've been in this thing six years. People join and go. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing it says heaven rejoices when one soul comes to know God you can join the biggest church or the smallest church but if you don't join the body of Christ nothing else matters you can serve and serve and I can preach and preach but if I don't live right nothing else matters Paul says that I may not be myself a castaway. The biggest decision you can make is to follow after Jesus. And I want to give you an opportunity to make a public statement. You say, Pastor, why do you have people come to make a public statement? Because salvation is the one thing we want to be private. Yet we sin publicly. You don't party in your room by yourself. 
You don't drink in your room by yourself. We do public things that don't align with the will of God. But then when it comes to God and giving our life to him, we're like, mm, let me just, I don't want to be seen. I remember when I was sinning publicly. I remember when I was out in the club publicly. And the cameraman would pass around with the lights and everybody was like, yeah. And so I got to publicly serve God. Because if one life can be a testimony, then your life can be a testimony too. If you want to make a public declaration to say this morning, this afternoon, I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I want to believe in the God who created the universe, the God who created the heavens and earth. Pastor, this morning, I want to do the one thing that I've been needing, the one thing that I've been wanting. I've done my job. I'm going to finish and go eat some food. My hands are clean. I feel free. I feel light. Now it's your turn. Will you come? The altar is open. Are you going to make the decision to say, I want to come to Jesus Christ this afternoon? This afternoon. Let all eyes on our feet. Eyes closed. If you're in this room and you know that God is pulling on you and he's tugging on you, and you want to say, Lord, I want to come this morning and I want to surrender my life to you. I encourage you to meet us at this altar so we can pray with you and pray for you. The altar is open. Let this message not be the one that's played over and over. Let this message not be one that's played over and over in your mind. I want to see you in heaven. I want to rejoice with you in heaven. I'm going to teach something for 30 seconds. For those who are saved and who are believers, moments like these are one of the most critical, sensitive moments. These are not moments, if you know you are saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, these are not moments where we look around. These are moments where we pray intensively. These are moments where we are wrestling against spiritual entities. I just want to teach that for 30 seconds. So if you're in this room and you know that if Jesus were to come today, you wouldn't have to worry about nothing, you ought to be interceding right now for the saints, for that person who the enemy is blocking their minds to say don't go out there. You ought to be interceding right now. You're, we are a church of prayer. You ought to be interceding. You ought to be interceding right now. Because saints are coming in to the altar. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. We don't wrestle against what's physical and what's natural. Come on out to the altar. The altar is open. You want to give your life to God. I'll wait for you. I'll wait for you. Is there anyone else who says I want to surrender? You know you're wrestling with it in your mind. You know that if Jesus came today, if he came right now, you are not sure of your salvation. Come get some clarity. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. If you need somebody to come walk with you, you lift your hands and I'll come get you in the seats. If you got a neighbor that you know you don't want to talk to, whisper to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, can you walk with me out here? I'll come get you. Jesus will leave the 99 for one. I will stay at this altar for the next one hour until you come. Until you come. I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to go to hell. Jesus wants to save you. 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 
You can repent this morning. There is salvation. There is salvation for you. You can be saved. You can be delivered. There is an opportunity for you to get God now. Tomorrow might be too late. You might leave here and get in a car accident. You might leave here and lose your life. Tomorrow might be too late. Today is a time of salvation. I don't want this message to play in your mind if you miss heaven. Jesus is calling you today, brother. Jesus is calling you today, sister. Will you give him a chance? Will you give him a chance? Will you give him a chance? Will you say, Lord, I want to give you a chance? Lord, I want you more than anything. I don't want to live this life of sin. I want to surrender everything that I am to you. I want to come to know you as the true and living God. I surrender all that I am for you to wash me white as snow. The blood of Jesus washes every sins away. The blood of Jesus changes you and it transforms you from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. 30 more seconds. 30 more seconds. 30 more seconds. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Is there anyone? You know the Lord is pulling on you. We bind every spirit of fear now. Go. Every spirit of doubt now. Go. In the name of Jesus. Go. 20 more seconds. 20 more seconds. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Is there anyone? God wants to save you. He can save you. What can wash away my sins? I Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. When you have come out to the altar, there is a confession that is necessary. Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord I want you to begin to repent and begin to talk to God and say God I'll repent from this sin and that sin you could talk privately you don't have to let the whole world know just begin to repent to God to say God I'm letting go of this I'm letting go of that I'm letting go whether it be lying, whatever it may be, whatever the situation may be, I'm letting go. 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 I'm letting it go. I'm confessing all my sins and iniquities to God. And now, between you and God, He's saying, Lord, I believe that you died for me. I believe that you want to save me. I believe that you died to set me free. I want you to do something that perhaps you have never felt comfortable to do before. Talk to God like you will be talking to another human being and begin to tell him, Lord, I want you to save me. Lord, I want you to deliver me. Lord, I want you to change my life. Lord, I want you to make me whole again. Lord, I need you more than the very breath that I breathe. I need you in my life. 
I need you to change me. I need you to fill me with your spirit. I need you. I need you. I need you. Say this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I give everything that I am. Take control. I believe that you died 